Okay. Yeah, I thank you guys so much for, for the added, uh, speakers and uh, the attendees that uh, for your outstanding intellectual input and uh, for your uh, support uh, of this program and, uh, and also for your persistence to the last session. Uh, and uh, so as you are aware, this is a very unique session and uh, it's really my honor to introduce the only speaker of this session, uh, Dr. Kevin Taka. Uh, we are so glad to have you here. And uh, Taka, Dr. Taka is an associate editor of uh, Science Translational Medicine. She's going to uh, provide her perspect editorial perspective of uh, translational science uh, pro uh, discovery. Dr. Taka. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. This has been a wonderful conference, and I'm very happy to be here and to be able to give you an, an editor's perspective on publishing transitional research. So to start, I want to give you a little background on the American Association for the Advancement of Science. This is the nonprofit organization with a mission of advancing science, engineering, and innovation for the benefit of all people. And they are the organization that is um, responsible for the science family of journals. And it was founded in 1848. Um, there's a lot of resources online. We do much more than just publish uh, journal articles, so please take a look at this, the resources at this website. But to give you a background on the science family, I hope you're all familiar with science. That's been around for many years. The science family, um, we, we try to publish broad papers with high general interests that are novel and have very high quality research. And so science was started in, in 1880 with the first issue. It's online and in print weekly. It's an interdisciplinary journal and it's uh, subscription access. So we have six journals in the science family. Science is one, um, another science signaling. This is our specialty journal focused on mechanism, uh, interested in signaling and physiology and health and disease, um, animal and human. This was relaunched in 2008 and is provided online weekly. Next, we have Science Translational Medicine. This is the journal that I work directly for. Our first issue was in 2009. We're also an online-only weekly journal, and we publish biomedicine in all aspects uh, within the translational space from preclinical to early phase clinical trials, and I'll get into more detail there. Our latest impact factor is 16.8. The other journals we have, um, our only open access journal is Science Advances started in 2015 and continuous online publication. And this is also an interdisciplinary journal with a scope very similar to science, so very broad. This is also um, run with academic editors, whereas the other journals have professional editors. And then our two newest journals are Science Immunology, which is a specialty journal focused on immunology launched in 2016. Um, right now we have rolling online publications, but they are collated into monthly issues. And Similarly, we have Science Robotics, also launched in 2016 with a focus on robotics. Now, just a quick note on open access. Like I mentioned, Science Advances is our only gold open access, which means authors pay full publication costs and your articles are immediately available. The other journals are green open access, where you pay some publication fees and this is subscriber-based. So now, Science Translational Medicine. What are we interested in? Who are we? What's our mission? So we are the leading journal, hopefully, we think we are, of high-impact, peer-reviewed research at the intersection of biomedicine and clinical applications. So like I said, we're trying to span from that preclinical space to early phase clinical trials. And our mission is to promote human health by fostering applications of basic science to clinical problems. We publish research articles uh, between three and five weekly. These are all peer-reviewed, and this is to promote biomedical research towards the clinic, and that's really what we mean by translation, something that will advance clinical practice. We also publish reviews. The majority of these are um, solicited, so we will, we will ask authors and leaders in the field to provide reviews. These are also peer-reviewed. These are synthesizing recent literature in translational areas that are of focus to our audiences and also fosters the translation of research to the clinic. We also publish perspectives, focuses, and editorials. These are 
commentaries. They're more future looking, um, suggesting new avenues of research, problems with current research and advances, uh, areas for advance. We also do discuss policy and regulatory issues, trying to encompass all aspects of that translational um, continuum. Just a quick note on access to our papers. So all papers are available one year after publication on the website. We also allow submission of the accepted version to PubMed within six months. So after six months, that your the six month date after your article is published, you can upload your accepted version to PubMed. And we also provide a referral link after your paper is published. You can use this referral link on your personal website, lab website, to provide a free version of your paper um, to those who click on the link. And we also have some resources for developing countries related to access to papers. So what are we interested in? We're very broad. Um, all areas of biomedicine, from cancer, immunology, gene therapy, metabolic disease, biomarkers, global health, neuro, nanomedicine, devices, diagnostics, bioengineering, which is itself a very broad term, um, and early phase clinical trials. As I said, we have a very broad audience. We want to speak to scientists, clinician scientists, clinicians, funding agencies, regulatory bodies, pharma and biotech. And we do accept submissions from pharma and biotech as well as, as academic researchers. We're trying to reach everyone with our uh, publications. So what do we mean by translational research? You've probably all seen this from bench to bedside image. And we really are focusing on this continuum in all aspects. So we will publish early studies that are more basic if they provide new insight into something that can be targeted therapeutically. Likewise, we'll also uh, publish early phase clinical trials, so phase one and phase two. And there we're, tr we're looking for something with a little bit of mechanistic insight. So do we have any insight into how this therapy might be working in these early stage uh, trials? And as I said, translational research is this bench to bedside forward. It's also the reverse. What have we learned from a clinical trial that teaches us something about disease or we can go back into the bench and, and figure out mechanistically. And then also, what needs to change to implement this therapy into clinical practice? So now I want to highlight four of our recent uh, cardiovascular and bioengineering papers. Um, they, they were just selected for topic, not, not listed in order of importance or any of that. But this is a nice example of an early preclinical study that identified a long non-coding RNA that's enriched in cardiac fibroblasts and therefore could be a useful target for cardiac fibrosis therapies. Um, and in the paper, they used antisense oligonucleotides in mouse models of myocardial infarction to show a reduction in fibrosis. And they also tested human samples. So what we liked with this paper is that mix of both mouse models and human tissue, showing that what they're seeing in the mouse likely has relevance to human disease, showing us that this has the potential to actually translate into a therapy. Although it's early, this is a good example of spanning that early phase of the translational continuum. This was an example closer to the other end of the spectrum that was mostly in humans, using imaging to look at adipocyte size and lipid volume, um, and linking that to inflammation and atherogenic, atherosclerotic plaque, plaque uh, stability in patients. So this was at the other end of the translational continuum developing something that's much closer to being used in the clinic using a non-invasive imaging method. This is a nice example that also uh, provides insight into our interest in the different areas of bioengineering. So we are interested in imaging as well as the development of therapeutics. A third example is repurposing a drug. So here we were rep repurposing a cancer drug for heart failure. And what was nice about this paper was the use of IPSC cardiomyocytes, which we've heard a lot about at this lovely conference. Um, and what we liked about this paper is in addition to both human and mouse cardiomyocytes, they also tested two mouse models, um, the TAC and the LAD, the LAD mouse models, and showed the therapy was effective in treating heart failure in these mouse models. And they also provided some mechanistic insight into how this might be working through blocking stress-activated genes. The last example, this was a really cool paper and made for a fun cover with um, additional video support online. Um, a good engineering paper, maybe not tissue engineering, but uh, in this paper they developed pneumatic muscles that worked like in a ventricular assist device without 
directly interrupting the blood flow or directly needing to be inserted into the blood flow. So this soft robotic sleeve acts um, around the heart to hug it and twist and compress and provide assistance in that manner. And this was tested ex vivo in, hum in pig hearts as well as an acute in vivo pig model. What we liked about that is the demonstration in the large animal model, um, which has very close uh, size to human um, parameters, meaning suggesting that this therapy could be easily translated um, to be applied to humans. And of course, I have to mention this perspective. So this perspective came out of a meeting, I think in 2015, and you'll notice that the co-authors, if you can see them, a lot of our speakers today um, are co-authors on this, on this manuscript. And what we liked about this perspective is it raised five important questions in the field based on what was discussed at the meeting. So you'll notice we don't publish many meeting reports, um, but we do like articles that identify new opportunities for growth in the field that point out problems with current research or areas that are lacking attention. And so this perspective identified five questions in the field. So what are appropriate models for cardiac tissue engineering? What solves should we be using? How important is vascularization and how will we achieve that with tissue engineering? What should we expect from preclinical trials and how will we implement these cardiac tissues going forward? So now I'd like to just get a little more specific with our journal, Science Translational Medicine, and discuss the peer review process. There are a lot of questions about how we conduct our review process, and peer review is very important to our mission to publish high quality, robust, and reproducible results. Now, the core functions of peer review are to select the appropriate papers, as, to act as quality control, and to uphold our journal standards, as well as the standards of research. Quality control is in increasingly difficult, but it's increasingly important. So we receive around 80 manuscripts every week, and we have six staff editors, so those manuscripts are divided among the editors. We also have a large board of reviewing editors, and I'll touch base on them in the next slide. So of the 80 manuscripts that are submitted each week, around 70 are triaged or rejected without review. The 30% that make it to in-depth peer review will go out to two to three reviewers who are leaders in the fields and we do select reviewers based on the different disciplines that are included in the research. So we'll look for someone who has specific expertise in the cardiac model that you're studying, the disease you're studying, and we'll try to include MDs and PhDs so that we can accurately capture the relevant clinical populations and clinical considerations. So of those papers that are reviewed, 10% or a little less ultimately make it to publication. Getting back to that first step, the staff editor and board of reviewing editor advisory initial evaluation. What we're asking for are advisory boards who are external, so they're not employed by the journal. They are leaders in the field across the world. We ask them to comment on the scope, the interest, and the novelty of the paper in a brief assessment. So they're not doing a deep dive into the paper. They're giving us the highlights and they're noting any flags that are apparent to them. And this can be based on their clinical expertise as well as their research expertise. And they'll give, give us their interest based on a scale of 10, 10 being this is the best paper, to one being there are some very critical flaws or concerns that limit my enthusiasm and I don't think this should be recommended for review. So now who's involved with the journal? Um, we have two co-scientific advisors, Garrett Fitzgerald and Eliezer Edelman. We have 60 additional board members in all areas of biomedicine. We have six acting editors. Um, we're led by Orla Smith. The other editors are listed there. And all of our editors are PhDs and or MDs with postdoc and or in industry experience. And we have a variety of backgrounds necessary to cover the broad range of papers that we receive. So how do we go about selecting appropriate referees for your paper? This is based on editor experience, suggestions from our board, database records, literature searches, conferences, and we try to capture people with a variety of expertise at different levels who can provide different insights into the paper. How many referees, like I mentioned, we go for at least three. Uh, not always possible because some, sometimes reviews aren't completed, uh, there's, but three is a good number because this can capture the different um, disciplines that are included in your paper. 
Uh, this can provide enough people to look at all aspects of the paper and it can ha be very helpful when there's split reviews. So what makes for a useful review? It's very helpful to provide a short synopsis of the paper. This tells me that you read the paper in all its detail. You know all the experiments that were included. Um, and you can comment on the quality of the experiments. Are there controls that are missing? Were there other models that should have been considered? What needs to happen to get this paper to publication? Or is it too far from publication that it, it should be rejected outright? What impact would this paper have on this field and in other fields? Will this move us one step closer to a clinical therapy? Are there any novelty concerns? Similar publications by the group who's authoring the paper, other groups? Are there publications that need to be mentioned? And then finally, a comment on presentation. Is it easy to follow? Is it interesting? Are there problems with the figures? Now, how many rounds of review? So of the papers that are rejected, 90% are rejected after one round of review. 10% receive an opportunity to revise according to reviewer comments and resubmit. If more data is added during review or there's new analyses, that will make the paper sent back to the same reviewers for a second round so that those reviewers can sign off on that new data. So rarely it's more than two rounds of review. Again, what are we looking for in our research articles? So we want insights and influence beyond one particular field. What can other researchers in other related or unrelated fields learn from your paper? We want our papers to serve as a template for future translational medicine, to be innovated, so conceptual novelty, and uh, approaching a problem in a sound and, uh, meth methyl meth <laughs> sound and meticulous manner, catalyzing new directions of research, uh, providing insights into human disease with uh, the potential for future therapies. And that, that's, again, speaking to that early stage of the translational continuum. So why, why do some papers ultimately become rejected? Well, if the paper is of interest to only a small field, so a spe too specialized, it might be better suited for a specialty journal. If it's too small of an, an advance, um, particularly a conceptual advance over previously published work, that could also be a reason for rejection. If it's confirmatory, just repeating examples of something that's already known, if the data are unconvincing, or if the data are insufficient to support the conclusions and, and claims are being overstated. Conversely, what makes a paper ultimately land um, in the acceptance pile, the study asks important questions, conclusions are well supported by data, the experimental design is very sound. The results provide new insights with uh, impact to the field and to translation of, of uh, clinical therapies, and of course, great science. So during this peer review process, we hear a lot of complaints from reviewers. It's too slow, there's too many rounds, we don't know what's going on, I don't get any credit for reviewing, review's not, not even, it, it's uh, biased, there's no post-publication discussion on websites. So what can we do about this? Um, one of the things the science family has started is cross-review. Um, and what we're looking for during cross-review, so during cross-review you'll receive the comments from the other reviewers and, and basically you're doing a review of the review process. And what we want to know is if this is improving the peer review process. Um, are we making decisions in a better manner? Are reviewers happier with this process? And does this help um, make review more fair, more polite, more relevant? And something to keep in mind when, when conducting reviews is, um, we've all been on both ends of the spectrum, and the review you provide should be one that you would want to receive. You know, high quality, timely, fair. So just a brief mention on why has it been difficult to translate the research advances we've had over the past 50 years into therapies that are actually effective in treating human disease. There are many reasons, and I'll only touch on two. And animal models and data irreproducibility. And we've heard a lot during this conference, mice are not small people. So many preclinical animal studies cannot be replicated, not because of fraud, um, but this is a problem. And irreproducibility of these preclinical data, coupled with uh, things that work in preclinical models, but then later in, in clinical trials don't work, um, has, has led to a, a costly problem for academia and industry and failure of many drugs. So as high as 80-some 80, 80 percent of drugs fail 
um, in, at, in phase two trials. So what can we do? Well, we do publish animal models of human disease, but we need that clear connection to human disease uh, to, to suggest that this is a strong translational model and the effects that we see in this model will be relevant to the human clinical populations. So these models that we do publish include humanized mice, large animal models, like I mentioned that pig study, patient-derived induced pluripotent stem cells, and human biopsy samples. And the best animal model of human disease is us. So we really do support um, efforts to include patient-derived pluripotent stem cell work. Um, and we need to move beyond traditional cell culture, you know, looking at 3D culture, looking at um, conditions that more closely mimic the in vivo environment when we're testing new drugs and therapies. Again, speaking to data irreproducibility and the problems with animal models, what can we do to help? So we've adopted the recommendations for reporting animal data, um, including randomization, blinding, sample size estimation, and data handling. We ask that individual subject level data for any experiment where your n is less than 20 is included in supplementary material so we can see that spread of data. Um, we ask that large data sets are deposited into the appropriate um, databases. And we have established reporting guidelines that we ask our authors to follow according to the type of study they're conducting. And during the review process, we give our authors this revision checklist. And we ask these specific points about study design. So every paper that we publish has a paragraph in the materials and methods that explicitly states the study design. And this should include things like blinding and ram randomization. We also ask the authors to include a specific paragraph on statistical analysis um, so that it's very clear how data were analyzed. Um, and, and we do make an effort to see that the appropriate statistical analyses are conducted. Now I'm just going to transition and touch on some basic tips for writing strong research papers. So there's five golden rules. Know, know your audience, write clearly, write concisely, write accurately, and please follow the instructions. So who's your audience? It's scientists in your field, outside your field, reviewers, editors, and it could be the press and general public. And most of these people are drowning in information and very busy. So you should make sure that every word you say in every sentence says what you mean to the appropriate audience. So avoid claims of novelty. Correlation is not causation. Proteins are not people. And you're not selling a used car, so please don't overinterpret or overstate or oversell your data. Think like your family. They want to know what you're doing, but they don't understand your experiments. Likewise, a scientist who's not in your field may not be familiar with terms that you're using, may, may not be familiar with the animal model you're using. So it's very important to provide enough background information that someone who is not immediately in your field can understand your study. Think like the funder who's getting a lot of requests for money, has five minutes to read your paper, wants to understand and support your research, but you need to make what you're writing very clear so that it's, it's easy to understand the impact of your study. And then think like the editor who has multiple manuscripts that they're handling at one time in addition to emails and pre-submissions. And our job is really to find the best papers and to showcase those papers in our journal. So again, make sure that you use all of the space you have in your research article to say what you really mean and to really highlight the importance of your study. Think about your research. What's important? What's advancing new concepts? Is your approach original? If so, you should highlight that, but don't overstate it. Um, are the data pr properly quantified and statistically evaluated? Did you perform the analysis uh, thoroughly? Are experiments controlled? Do you have all the proper controls? Negative, positive. The presentation, did you proofread? Um, are the results described and not just, do you, this is figure two, this is figure three? Are figures clear? Does the discussion account for other research published in the field, not just your own? And this is, it's a good idea to ask scientists in your own field, scientists outside your field, and an editor or writer um, who's familiar with English language if that's not your first language. Especially for engineers. Engineers have amazing technology, but the presentation is so important. You know, we need to understand why your technology is important, why your advance is important, not just how you made your device or how you construct your therapy. And then think like a science journal reviewer. 
if you saw this paper, would you think this is really important, this changes my, my thinking for my lab, I can't wait to share this with others, or what were these people thinking? And as an editor, is there a good reason to accept or reject this paper? Is the paper within our scope? Is the paper competitive? And can I convince my fellow editors that this is so important that we need to review and publish this? And then finally, the cover letter. So this is a very important document that sometimes people don't submit. This is your one chance to speak directly to the editor. So why is your study important? What are you studying? How did you solve it? Why should I be excited? So keep it short. And if you're reusing it from another journal, don't forget to change the name of the journal. <laughs> so with that, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity and your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. You can also catch me later if you'd like. Uh, so, okay, we're going to wrap this up with um, uh, a few concluding remarks from uh, our dean of the School of Engineering, Ewan Alexander. Uh, uh, Ewan came to us, uh, I guess, a half years ago uh, from Case Western um, uh, in aerospace engineering and mechanical engineering. Um, uh, has been a, a friend to biomedical engineering as much as anyone could expect from a dean of an entire school. So um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Ewan. Thank you, Joel. And thanks to all the participants, especially those of you who've remained to, to close this uh, great, great symposium out. Uh, once again, th this symposium has uh, attracted a variety of different types of, of scientists and engineer. They've converged truly in the sense that uh, the National Research Search Council have, uh, have used the word convergence to, to solve one of the most pressing problems in, uh, in medicine. And I, and I think every time you have had this conference, I think this is the third one I've been to, you see some distinct advances. To advances. I think we've also seen uh, an increase in the, in the variety of participants, different types of engineers, various types of scientists and medical researchers. So I thank you all for coming. I thank particularly the organizers, Drs. Barry uh, Ken, and of course our very own uh, Jay Zhang, sitting up in the back there grinning. This has been a successful conference. I hope we get to welcome you back here again uh, in another year. And I wish you all uh, safe travels home. Thank you. <laughs>